This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Welcome back to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. Thanks for joining me as I read you a scary bedtime story. Tonight, let's take a trip back to the 90s, before we could use our cell phones to call for help wherever we were. This tale is sure to leave a sour taste in your mouth. When I was 16, I had a summer job delivering groceries for the local mom and pop market. It was 1994 and the AC in my old mustard yellow station wagon was not keeping up with the blistering July heat. After my fifth delivery of the day, I sat in the break room of the store, putting my hair up and laying some wet paper towels on my neck. As much as I begged my manager not to, he insisted I wear the polyester brown pants and orange polo shirt that was the standard uniform. I tried to tell him that the inevitable pit stains I would suffer at the hands of my sauna of a car would be off-putting to customers, but he wouldn't hear it. I was just starting to cool off when boss man barreled in the swinging door. Hey, Steph, we got another delivery for you. He waved a receipt in front of my face. I groaned and put my head on the table. Come on, kiddo. You could be out chasing cards all day like Robbie. Plus, it's only one item, and it isn't too far. Too far ended up being about 15 miles out of town. The drive only took about 20 minutes, but that's a road trip in small town time. Sticky beads of sweat were running down both sides of my face, and my throat was burning from the smell of my engine protesting the heat. I glared at the box of limes in my back seat through my rearview mirror. That was all the customer ordered. A single goddamn 20-pound box of limes. What could possibly prompt someone to order an entire box of limes on the hottest day of the year? They weren't on sale, so that ruled out the obsessive couponers, those housewives who spent their lives trying to save a penny on a gallon of hand soap. And considering we were a dry county, I doubted it was some sort of last-minute margarita emergency. After passing mile after mile of cornfields and turnip patches, I turned my car into a dirt road leading up to what looked like an old ranch that had been out of commission for a long time. It was lined with broken wooden fences, overgrown weeds baked by the sun, and bales of rusting chicken wire were scattered across to either side. My car was creating a massive dust cloud, but through the haze I made out a two-story farmhouse about a hundred yards away. That was when I realized it wasn't just dust I was trying to see through. Steam and smoke bellowed out of the hood. My engine finally had it. I turned off my car, glaring at the house. I hoped the owners could spare a cup of coolant when I got to the door, or at least their phone so I could call my dad. Peeling myself off the vinyl seats and into the dusty heat, I grabbed my citrusy cargo and headed off. The distance hadn't seemed so bad when I was driving, but now it looked further with every step. The box just kept getting heavier. The heat was bringing out the oil and the lime skin. The perfume-like smell hit me in the face, stinging my eyes, like they were mocking me. Doesn't everything feel so personal when you're a teenager? When I finally got to the porch of the old house, sweat was running into my eyes. I dramatically dropped the box and banged on the screen door. A scraggly man, who looked to be about in his late 20s, opened the interior door. He stared at me with a confused look on his face. He... he, you're not Robbie. He wrung his hands together. Um, no, I'm Stephanie. I brought your box of limes, and I was hoping I could... I thought they would send Robbie. He was agitated. No, uh, Robbie backed his car into Mrs. Ajimi's mailbox last week, so they took him off deliveries. Also, I was wondering if I could use your phone? 
My what? He looked at me wildly. Looking back, it was definitely stupid to insist that the irate and unkempt man, who clearly did not want me to be there, let me inside of his house. Your phone. It's just... My car died and I need to call my dad to pick me up, I pleaded. You see, he said through clenched teeth, I ordered this heavy box, thinking they would send him for sure. What are they thinking, sending a girl out to the middle of nowhere with a 20-pound box? His eyes darted around the yard behind me. I mean, he gets off of work at six if you want to hang with him. Are you a friend of his brother's or something? That seemed to make him chill out. He held the screen door open. Come on in. You can use the phone. The house felt too still and unlived in. It was hotter inside than out, and it didn't have that house smell, you know? The smell of cooking and cleaning supplies, or the general smell people leave when they occupy a space. It was just the dry smell of the dirt and dust that coated every surface of the house. The man led me to the kitchen and gestured for me to sit at a table that was nestled between the counter and the back door. He picked up a lemon yellow phone off the base on the wall and listened. Like, he wasn't sure if it was going to have a dial tone or not. Then handed the receiver to me. What's the number? He turned his back, his finger poised to dial for me. Oh, I can just do it myself. I had known since kindergarten not to give my phone number to strangers. He didn't move. He just stood there, silent. After 30 seconds or so of this awkward standoff, I practically screamed out the number. (laughs) I was so annoyed. My teenage brain was more embarrassed and irritated than scared. I was obviously bothering this guy. Plus, he was letting me call my dad. The killers on 2020 never let their victims call for help. It's ringing. I looked up and said sheepishly to him. Robert's Manufacturing, this is Joyce. How may I help you? An overly cheerful voice answered. Mrs. Bergman, it's Steph. Is my dad there? It's really important. The man was now seating himself across from me at the table, watching me. Oh, sure, honey. Let me get him for you. Her voice was muffled as she covered the receiver. Trey, your daughter's on the phone. She says it's important. I heard my dad's deep voice. Though I couldn't make out what he was saying, just knowing he was there made me feel much better. I realized I was a lot more nervous than I thought I'd been. Hold on, honey bunch. He's on a call. It'll be just a minute. Mrs. Bergman's chirpy tone annoyed me, and... Before I could argue that my call was more important, she had put me on hold. The man started to drum his fingers on the filthy table. I'm sorry. My dad's on the phone. His secretary put me on hold. I tried to smile at him. He just stared at me with his pale blue eyes. They seemed to bore a hole in me. I felt like he was watching me to make sure I didn't reveal something to my dad. What that was, I didn't know. I couldn't help but feeling like I needed a lie, though. I just didn't know what to lie about. A minute turned to two, or at least it felt that way. I could tell the man felt the same way. He got up suddenly and began pacing the small kitchen. I focused my attention on the table in front of me. Just pick up, Dad. Come on, please. Just pick up. After five minutes had passed, I knew my dad had forgotten that I called. He was probably in the shop and didn't see the little red light blinking on the phone. Mrs. Bergman had to leave early every Thursday and had most likely taken off right after she put me on hold. I was frozen, though. I couldn't bring myself to put the phone down. It was like I could see through that little red light blinking in my dad's office. I could see all that was safe. Did that mean that I wasn't safe? Just as the thought crossed my mind, 
I was suddenly ripped from my chair. The man's bony fingers dug into my arm. I yelled and tried to pull away, but his grasp was too strong. I tried desperately to grab onto anything on the floor. I finally turned my head and bit him on the hand as hard as I could. He let me go, and I fell to the floor. I crawled towards the back door. On the way, I grabbed for the cord of the telephone. I maniacally started screaming for my dad, hoping to God that he would pick up and hear me. The man grabbed me by the ankle and pulled. It was on all fours that caused me to come crashing straight down on my chin. He dragged me across the floor. I was dazed and couldn't even think to kick to free myself. He stood me up and shoved me in a closet. My forehead banged hard into the coat rack. My ears rang and I slunk down to the ground as he slammed the door shut. I was in complete darkness. I heard the sound of heavy furniture being dragged across the floor, then being forced up against the door. I was trapped. As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life. And one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on. And something that has helped me tremendously is Rocket Money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. After a few minutes, I heard a truck start up and drive away. I tried with all my might to make that door budge. I thrust my shoulder into the door as hard as I could over and over and over until I heard a loud pop, followed by the worst pain I had ever felt. Despite the pain, somehow I fell asleep. I awoke to sirens and men's voices. I screamed as loud as I could, which wasn't very. My throat was coated with dust and I was incredibly dehydrated. Thankfully, though, an officer heard me. Over here was followed by the furniture in front of the door being moved. My parents were waiting outside by the ambulance. When they saw me, my mother broke down in tears, and my father began yelling about finding whoever did this. After all that time had passed, my face had turned into a horror show. I was bleeding from my chin and forehead, and everything was swollen and bruised. I was laying in my hospital bed when Robbie's mom came rushing in. She had red hair like Robbie did. In my morphine haze, I could only make out every other thing she said to me. She grabbed my hand and begged me to tell her where Robbie was. He had disappeared without a trace. Well, both of us had. We were both off at six. Neither of us had come home. When our parents contacted the store, my manager told them that I had gone out to the country to make a delivery. He suggested that Robbie must have met up with me and we were probably off being teenagers out on a ditch bank somewhere. When they saw my car at the end of the dirt road, they thought they would find us both. When they saw no trace of either of us, they came back to town and called the police so they could search the house. I told them everything I could about the man about how he had asked about Robbie and was expecting him when I arrived. Everyone was confused. 
His parents had no idea who this man could be or why he would have wanted Robbie. I didn't know why the man hadn't killed me, or maybe he thought he had. Maybe he thought I would die out there, in that hot and dusty house, alone in the dark. A week later, I received my first lime. It was sitting on the front porch when I got home after a much-needed day of watching bad movies and eating junk food at a friend's house. I tossed it into the yard, not thinking much of it. The next one came only a few days after that. This one was on the desk in my room. I ran downstairs and told my parents. They contacted the police. The police had already searched the old house, but they searched again. I told them the man had to have gone back for the box. I knew there was no way he would have risked going into our one and only grocery store just to buy limes to mess with me. They searched the house and again found nothing. Less than nothing this time, because I was right. The box of limes was gone. For months after that, I was tormented. There never seemed to be any rhyme or reason for why he was doing it. I would find them on the hood of my car, in our mailbox, once in a coat pocket. They began showing up rotted and soft. I was able to smell them before I could see them. That overly sweet smell of decaying fruit. Every time I told my parents, they told the police and nothing was found, not even a shoe print outside my window. I tried going to Robbie's parents, but my ramblings about finding fruit everywhere just upset his mother and his father asked me to leave. After senior year, I attended college in Alaska. I wanted to get as far away as I possibly could from my stalker. One day, during my first Alaskan winter, I received a package from home Well, from my home address anyway. It wasn't from home. It was from him. Inside, nestled in a bed of fake cotton snow, was a black and shriveled lime. Did you know that there are approximately 100 limes in a 20-pound box? During the previous year and a half, I had probably received about 90-something. I finally understood his message. I walked down the hallway of my dorm to the shared phone. My stomach turned sour and I felt bile burn the back of my throat. Luckily, it was late on a Friday and most of my floor was out partying, so I didn't have to wait my turn. I dialed my parents' number. Hello? My mother answered. Nothing in her voice indicated anything was amiss but she has a great phone voice. Mom, did they find Robbie? My voice was shaky. I knew the answer. Oh, oh God, Stephanie, how did you hear about that so fast? Your father just got off the phone with one of his friends down at the precinct. They thought we should know. You're so far away though, honey. You have nothing to... It was the limes, Mom. They were counting down. He was letting me know that Robbie was still alive. I could have done something. I could have helped him somehow. No, no, honey, this is in no way your fault. Her soothing voice was just too far away to work. I told him. I told him when Robbie was off work. I made him let me inside. I could have just left. I could have hitchhiked back to the store and told him some creep was asking about him. I should have called the police instead of dad. I was hyperventilating. All I wanted was my mom to hold me, but I had selfishly run away. I ran away instead of trying to find him. I hung up the phone and ran down the hallway to my room. I curled up in bed and stayed there for days. It took me 23 years to look up what had happened to Robbie. I couldn't bring myself to know what sort of state his body had been found in, what the man had done to him. 
Robbie Jensen was found propped up against the door of the grocery store we had worked at. He was wrapped in plastic sheeting. Our old manager found him around 4 a.m. when he arrived to work the opening shift. He was missing several teeth. Some had been removed and some were broken. The tips of both his index fingers were gone. One of them was almost healed, the other was fresh. He had been sexually assaulted with foreign objects. Likely one of them was a broken bottle. Robbie had also been castrated post-mortem. He died from a gunshot to the head. I never wanted to know all that. Even without all that knowledge rattling around in my brain, I've had to attend years of therapy. They say I have an extreme case of survivor's guilt as well as the paranoia the stalking left behind. I never wanted to know. But I have to know. Today, my son came home from school and handed me a letter. He said it was in his locker, but it had been addressed to me. Probably something from his counselor about his English grade. Before it reached my hand, I could smell it. That citrusy perfume. The envelope was doused in it. Inside was a receipt for a 20-pound box of limes. At the top, in slanted handwriting, was my son's name. Thanks for listening. Check back next Thursday for our next episode. It's sure to leave you shaking. If you'd like me to read one of your stories on the show, feel free to email me at scareyoutosleep at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at scareyoutosleep or give our Facebook page a like. Music and sound effect credits are available in our show notes. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.